Hello, welcome again to Sport Unlocked in the middle of a pack sporting summer. Joining me, Rob Harris from Sky News as ever, Martin Ziegler from The Times and Tarek Panja from The New York Times. Well, we've all been out in Germany at various times. I'm speaking to you from Cologne at the moment. <clears throat> Is it, uh, is it woe de Cologne? I think some headlines I saw. Uh... Well, some performances have stunk here a bit on the pitch. <laughs> Rob, but you, you managed to get yourself to one of the biggest moments in the tournament so far. What was it like being at that victory for Georgia over Portugal, qualifying for the next stage, a country that never played in a major tournament as an independent nation? What, what was it like there, Rob? Oh, it was an incredible atmosphere in Gelsenkirchen. The Georgia fans were absolutely ecstatic, purely as a performance. Georgia was a team so energetic, so electrifying, on the front foot, really taking the game to Portugal. Even though Portugal had already secured their passage, you still had Ronaldo starting. It was still a strong team that they did put out. And yeah, one of the biggest results in Georgian football history. Probably the biggest. Interestingly, they finished in qualifying in a group behind Scotland, Spain. Did they finish by Norway as well? And they qualified through the Nations League. They did, the, the, the other route. So this is, a, this is a team that's come through the alternative route. And guys, it's part of the expansion as well from the Euros, so more teams can get through. But we've talked about whether, you know, this issue of expansion, 16 teams or 24. But when you see the scenes in the stadium there, when you see, like, the, the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, people partying all night, horns blaring. You could see why this has happened as well. There's a case for this, even though, you know, perhaps the standard of football, some people say, have gone down. It, it does matter, doesn't it? Yeah, I think uh, the the format is not good, is it? Because you're, you're basically playing a whole group stage just to lose eight teams. Um, so that's not great. But there they may be other ways around it. But um, I think it is, you know, there's certainly all the teams there just about sort of deserve their place in the finals. So, and as you say, you know, giving Georgia that chance is, is really important. Willie Sanyol has become a bit of a cult figure, the, the Frenchman who's, who's their head coach, uh, including a sort of very violently worded press conference where he sort of rounded on his crit- critics and used a very Anglo-Saxon phrase and he called them twats, didn't he? The country uh, got its independence in... I think around 1990, from former after the breakup of the former Soviet Union, and this is the biggest crisis that it's faced. Some people say it's being pulled in two halves with a new law, with some saying that is a Russian law, um, pulling it towards Russia, and others want to join the EU. And there've been street protests um, over the past few months. So yes, massive moment for the country. This football result, and this has been a tournament. Not exactly free of politics. We've got the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We've got Balkan tensions certainly manifesting themselves. The old Yugoslav wars, we're seeing the impact of those, whether it's a flag showing what Kosovo is part of Serbia. We've got Croatia and Albania fans with anti-Serbian chants. Serbia themselves having being punished by UEFA, then threatening themselves to quit the tournament if Croatia and Albania aren't punished. There's been a lot of uh, politics for UEFA to grapple with. Yeah, there has been a lot. I mean, they even had this sort of ludicrous situation, which was never going to happen, where the Serbian FA chief was sort of claiming that he might sort of leave the tournament um, because of the Albanian Croatian fans singing... <laughs> Joining forces at a match to sing anti-Serb songs, and that obviously didn't happen. But it, yeah, it is a sort of tricky one when you have these sort of political demonstrations. It's even led to one player actually being um, disqualified from taking part in the rest of the tournament. Well, also, not just a player, there was the incident with a Kosovan journalist. This is a team that isn't here. Um, he was attending a, the England-Serbia game or a Serbian game, maybe the second Serbian game. and. There were those crowds um, chants about Kosovo, and he replied by making the kind of double-handed eagle gesture, signifying um, Albania, um, and that was a, a spark of contention. He got banned; his accreditation got banned for the tournament. Um, but in an interview with the Guardian, 
and this is the situation. These wars weren't that long ago, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. He talked about his family home being bombed and the trauma. And, and with the crowd chanting what it was chanting, it all became a bit too much for him. So it's, I guess, you know, these are the Euros and it brings all of Europe to one place and all of the issues that, that come with those. And at times we do hear UEFA saying they want to keep politics out of football, but they are forced into taking politically based decisions. Even while the tournament was on, they put out the competition regulations for the Champions League, for instance. It's a reminder that UEFA separates countries in Europe due to tensions, and that can be those in the East, but also, of course, as we often highlight, Spain and Gibraltar can't play each other. If they're drawn together, they redraw it. Yeah, I mean, just uh, an example of how the, the Balkans can um, become involved in, in, in politi- be a political football is um, Boban, who uh, up until January was UEFA's head of football, was only a Boban, when he was um, a player, he uh, was involved in a fight with a policeman during uh, the early 1990s uh, on the pitch because uh, there was a sort of, it was just before the sort of Yugoslavian civil war started. Lots of tensions there. There was demonstrations. Police came on the pitch. Uh, he kicked a policeman and was hit with a truncheon. Um, you can just see that, you know, these things are still going on many years later. Yeah, well, splitting these teams, Rob, is interesting. So what have England done? They seem to avoid all the big teams when it comes to major tournaments. Is that is that something we've been kept away from? playing major football nations for political reasons or, or is, it, is it something else? Supposedly easier routes through to nominal finals, which only increase the pressure perhaps on them when they don't perform on the pitch. Certainly the way the paths have opened up in recent tournaments have looked more favourable. But this has been a tournament perhaps defined by some of the critics, often on platforms like this podcast. I don't know if people outside of the, the it, Britain might have realised, but... For the last week, the second week of the tournament, really, Britain has been um, kind of engulfed in Gary Lineker v England. What, what's it all about? Well, Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer, BBC pundits, former players, was very scathing about England's performances, but on a, especially so on a podcast that um, the company owned by Gary Lineker produces. Um, and I think Lineker used the phrase, England were shit which um, obviously was quite provocative and um, led to uh, Harry Kane responding, the England captain, and then a sort of lot, lots of stuff about, is this, you know, should Lineker be using his his, uh, his podcast to, to do this? And um, it's a bit of a storm in a teacup, I think, you think? One of the issues Lineker then had in response is this turned into a multi-day storm a multi-day news cycle which probably anyone everyone benefited from in some way apart from if you were in the england camp was um gary lineker saying that the media should up, put their own opinions in the press conferences don't just fall back on citing someone else like him as a former player say what you really think it, let's look at how we operate a lot of the time we're dealing with the sports politics we wouldn't stand up at a press conference if there was one with one of the football <laughs> administrators to sort of say I think you should not stand for re-election. Then what would you be left saying? Tell me why I'm right. I mean, you're there to pose a question or a thought, aren't you? Or to, to challenge on some policy, not to say yeah. what you think. Or you're not, wouldn't stand at a press conference saying, John Infantino, you should scrap VAR. You, you yeah, pose exactly. a question sort of saying about the calls, pe- clubs calling for it, countries calling for it. What, what, you know, what does he think about that? Yeah, it's also it's also the standing, isn't it, Rob? I mean, um, I've seen you play football. You're not that bad, but you didn't score. Is it 48 goals for England or 49 goals now? Uh, you know, Lineker is is straddling these two areas, which is also really fascinating for me. He he co- talks about the media, but he he is the media as well, isn't he? I mean, he was separating himself from from the media and has been, but he he is now a member of the media in many ways. He owns the media company that he does. He's releasing these podcasts. He works for the BBC as well. But he's also Gary Lineker, one of the greatest strikers England has produced. And that 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 puts him in a kind of a strange position and a special position. Um, but he's also 
I'm sure, um, quite happy with all that engagement. It's brought a lot of attention to his private podcast business. Yeah, I'm sure he is. Um, I mean, uh, which might might be might be part of the reason he uh, is being so um, outspoken about it. But I mean, I, I think it's it's a bit lame to say, you know, why don't the media have their opinions? Of course, you know, most newspapers do, but you know, they do opinion pieces, and people have been slating the England team. But you know, it's a fact of life. If you're a high profile former player, your view is going to get. Um, you know, lots of clicks. And that's why, you know, every time Gary Neville or Roy Keane says something about Manchester United on Monday Night Football on Sky or whatever, then it's like, you know, loads and loads of websites run those stories because they're a sort of high-profile former player. That's just that's just the fact of life. Whether, you know, I think if Tamarik Panja saying Manchester United uh, you know, had a mediocre game, it's probably not going to drive quite as many clicks. Not quite. Don't know, Ziggs. Come on. Yeah, just to turn in places like FIFA and UEFA where they're perhaps scrutinising every single word we're saying on here. Yeah, well, wait, wait until wait until the former players get involved, guys. Well, that's the podcast. What about the sponsors of these Euros? One country in particular, very visible around matches, Qatar. Qatar Airways, visit Qatar on the ad hoardings. Obviously... Germany organises this event with UEFA, but isn't doing things like selling sponsorship. But Qatar, of course, was one of the most vocal against Qatar during the World Cup in 2022. That picture of the Germany national team with the fingers over the lips with the silence uh, symbol, weren't they? Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite interesting, isn't it, how things turn out. As you rightly said, Germany, even the viewing numbers in Germany of the Qatar World Cup, because of the, the strength in feeling in Germany in particular over hosting the World Cup in Germany, was 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 down on what Germany would normally expect. The team didn't perform, um, and then here we come to the Germany's um, Euros chance to brand Germany, and there's Qatar kind of placed all over the tournament. The overlay is a Qatari one. Funny, funny how that's worked out. And it's not even much of a talking point. It just sort of exists there. The uh, Qatar sponsorship around the the pictures. More people yeah, are talking not... about things like trains in Germany and how yeah. they're <laughs> operating or not, or uh, to the benefit of fans. Yeah, the, the Deutsche Bahn, that's, a, that's been one of the stories of the tournament. Just on Qatar Airways, it's not only around the fields. They've also um, got a lot of paid influencers at the tournament. I, I just happened to um, sit next to a young guy from the Netherlands. I think he was a 22-year-old person. And he, he, um, he, he, he told me what he was doing there. He's a, his trip is paid for by, by Qatar Airways. He's got the VIP access, um, the accommodation. And what does he have to do? He he has to kind of film himself and his reactions to to games at tournaments. Also filming the the action on the field, which might be um, a breach of some of the broadcasting. Although contract. as a sponsor, they're probably incorporate that into their various deals yeah not not quite sure about that actually talking to somebody <laughs> away. however it does give them this this level of engagement and i said well what do you have to do he said he does what he normally does and he just has to tag um qatar airways and a few slogans related to them and i said is he on his own he said no there's several of these guys so if you're at a football match um probably in the vip seats and not, not not us lot you see someone filming themselves this is pretty much what that is all about. But are they actually reporters who would be doing things like a regular match report as well, or is they purely there just to post something from the game and promote Qatar Airways? Definitely not a, a reporter or anyone with that sort of media training. And I, when I say influencers, this is a business now. These young, these young cre- content creators, influencers, if you want, these aren't journalists or, or members of the media in any way. They've got their own audiences. It's kind of organic. They follow each other, copy each other. And, you know, because there are so many, the reactions and what they do, you know, get have to get more and more extreme in some case to get that attention. That's what I found interesting. I asked this fellow, are there are there lines that you won't cross? And, you know, for him, it was to do with his faith. He said he wouldn't be doing anything involving alcohol or gambling, for example. You know, they're in such a busy environment. And to get noticed, you do have to really do a bit more than the last person did. So he had media accreditation, did he? No. No. Oh, okay. No, he didn't. Yeah. It's 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 a VIP VIP access in oh, the okay. in the VIP 
seats that what the sponsors you, what have you doing provided. In the <laughs> That's a really good question. No, nope, we met in a in a in a coffee shop um, um, in Dortmund. You thought you'd caught him out then. Zeke mm. thought he was going to break some news. I saw your little <laughs> beady eyes whirring there, Zeke. Sorry, pal. In your face. <laughs> You know what it does do in the blurring of lines between influencers and media is if people have the image, perhaps, of being a member of the media, even a journalist who is reporting for an event or there to sort of inform for an event. If you are linked to a sponsor like that, you're overly positive, perhaps, and it means you're overlooking the substantive issues. So you're giving a distorted impression of the event. You could be noticeably absent in having anything to say about you know, legitimate challenges around the tournament or issues that fans are facing. Yeah, I mean, looking at the, the, the guy's feed, I must say it's um, pretty basic and it's not organic at all. It's it's pretty much standard. I'm going to go and watch, name the match, be supporting whichever team has scored the goal and, and reacting to it. This This kind of is this artificial excitement around an event. I, I mean... I don't know, it's a long time since I was, you know, in his demographic. I think he said his audience is 13 to 22. But again, just someone filming themselves going nuts with whichever team scores and it's the same person. I just, personally, I don't know how it's that interesting, but obviously, Qatar always find it interesting. There's engagement there. Maybe this is the way the game is going. Well, maybe that's why you get fans running onto the pitch and attempt to get selfies. And we saw this with kids at the Portugal game attempting to get their pictures with Cristiano Ronaldo, it did lead to what an unusually, I'd say, detailed UEFA statement during this tournament talking about beefed-up security measures to uh, to prevent that. Not just kids uh, in that case. There was a, there was a six separate incidents at a game against Turkey, the second Portuguese group stage game in um, Dortmund um, last weekend. Portugal won the game 3-0, pretty standard. The most interesting thing were those pitch invasions. And there were grown men as well, four, four during the game, two after, one that led to a steward um, taking down a Portuguese player in Ronaldo's team. He came sliding on to get, get well, he missed to get his hands on whoever this selfie taker was and absolutely barreled into a Portuguese player. You know, that could have ended up in, in, a, in a worse situation. The player could have been injured. And also, in this case, guys, these are people looking for selfies. But the fact they're getting so close to players, what if they wanted to do something else? There's pretty serious security risks here. Well, a fan did attempt to jump onto Cristiano Ronaldo in the final round of group stage matches. It, their security did intervene. Well, that's the Euros. At the moment, we've got the Copa America going on in North America. I've not been able to follow that much of it. I did see something about the uh, food costing $25 for a hot dog uh, for the media. No one likes to hear media complaints, but perhaps that's reflective of the, the fan experience too. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, from what we've picked up, it is a, an expensive tournament there uh, and, a, and a pretty hot one. There's some, some pretty uh, extreme temperatures, which... I think it's going to be an interesting one for both the Club World Cup next year and the World Cup 2026. Yeah, both of those points um, were kind of evident in a game between uh, Canada and Peru the other day. Played in Kansas, uh, the the, the uncovered stand behind the goal was practically empty. Um, The stadium wasn't full at all anyway, but I just wonder if that direct sunlight would have been a reason to not be in, in that stand. That that game also had an interesting moment for, for those of us in in Europe who are not used to seeing VAR used this way. Um, there was a red card um, dished out to Peru in the first half. Miguel Araujo, I think, was the, was the player. The referee went to the screen. It was a tackle. The fellow got the ball but then followed through. He was asked to look at the, the, the monitor. He came back, rescinded a yellow card and gave a red card. But what was interesting was he had a microphone and he spoke into it and told the, the stadium, um, the fans in the stadium, exactly what had happened. Um, and I thought that kind of clarity was, is quite helpful. We've seen it in the World Cup before. Those tournaments go on, but in the world of club football, it's all about transfer trading. 
and sorting out the account. So many questions being raised. Why Premier League clubs in the middle of the summer, before their players are even back from their breaks, are so busy doing various deals of players you might not be so familiar with and how much this is about the June 30 accounting deadline and getting the books in order to comply with profit and sustainability rules. So, what are these deals that we've seen this week? And why so many raising questions? Because of this looks like young players are being transferred um, between clubs, like um, you know, almost like swap deals, just in order for these clubs to comply with the profit and sustainability rules. Um, I'm sure the clubs involved would insist that you know this is all part of their actual normal transfer strategy, nothing to do with that. But it is a bit strange. For example, Aston Villa signed um, Everton's academy product Lewis Dobbin um, and at the same time Everton signed Aston Villa's academy product Tim Erogbenham, um for around £9 million. Pounds. Now the reason why this uh, is important for a PSR um, compliance is that the transfer fee you receive you can bank immediately and that, that goes into your account straight away and the fee you pay that can be split over the length of your contract. So if you buy somebody for £10 million on a five-year contract, that actually only costs you £2 million for that year, but you've earned, say, £10 million from selling your player to the club, which also has PSR difficulties. I think there's a, so there's a question. A, are they fair market value? B, is it right for these players if they're just pawns in the game, they're just being shuffled around? And I suppose, C, is this just another loophole? We've seen Chelsea selling hotels to a sister company. Should these should this loophole be closed um, or even be allowed? What are any of the clubs involved saying about this? Well, obviously, no one's saying that we're yes, we're you know we're doing this for PSR reasons at all. They're not saying that. They just saying this is their transfer strategy. I wonder what the competitive market was for Lewis Dobbin um, and the the player who moved to Aston Villa. Chelsea have also been involved uh, signing a player that, according to at least media reports, um, a youth player who's played maybe or appeared in maybe two matches for Aston Villa has, has moved for... Nineteen million pounds to to Chelsea. Um, you know, guys, it always seems to be the same group. But it's you know, this is not an English quirk, by the way. It's the first time we've seen it here. But this was an issue um, that had infested and infected Italian football and Serie A for a for a considerable amount of time until it became a scandal known as Plus Valenza or Capital Gains in 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 Italian football, where clubs were beefing up their balance sheets doing deals like this, most notably Juventus, who had scores of players moving in and out for, for this reason. And eventually that led to a investigation by not only football authorities, but Italian financial authorities it remains ongoing. Um, and the expulsion of almost the entire directorate of Juventus, including Andrea Agnelli, who was one of the architects of the Super League. Is this just something the Premier League didn't foresee when introducing the regulations, or is it clubs trying to sort of find various ways of ensuring compliance? And at the same time, it's impacting homegrown academy prospects as well. I think probably, almost certainly, the Premier League didn't envisage this happening when they set up the the rules. I mean, that was... Uh, 12 years ago, I think, when they were actually drawn up. So, but Terry is right to mention the, the experience of, of Italy. I mean, that's on a sort of uh, a very different level. But English football needs to be careful that it doesn't go down that route because, as you say, if you're, if you're sort of inflating the the value of players, um, and I'm not saying they have been in this case, but like they did in Italy, that, that that's a serious issue, not just for football, but... For you know, tax authorities, for example. Obviously, no claims that is happening with these clubs that we have discussed so far in the Premier League. No, the Italian case was interesting because it required, um, it ended up being exposed in a, in a sense because of everyone knew it was happening or whatever, but it was wiretaps 
um, that actually led people, investigators to this because people were directly Im implicating themselves in these in these phone calls. But just on the PSR, this this number, it's uh, what is it, a hundred and five million over three years, three seasons. Clubs are allowed to lose. The weird thing here is that that's not. It now seems like that's a number that teams are trying to get to. Let's get to 105 million. It's not like, I don't understand how it's become this. It's not, it's now become a target to to reach rather than a, a kind of buffer. When did this, why has this happened all of a sudden? Well, if you got that buffer, surely you would use it because it'd be maximising it to the advantage to assemble the squad. If you've got that wriggle room built in. Yeah, I, I think this is this is this is all coming up though because it, there's one more year of PSR. Um, Aston Villa failed in an attempt to, to raise the limit from 105 million to 135 million. Um, we've seen points deductions handed out to Everton, Nottingham Forest last season, so I think everybody is basically desperate to um, you know, try and avoid action themselves. I think the really interesting thing here is how the Premier League responds to this. There are good face rules, like clubs have to operate with uh, with good face towards a league and towards other clubs. So, you know, is this a breach of good faith? I mean, my instinct is that the Premier League will be reluctant to get dragged into more legal issues, but um, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see how they actually react. Are they going to fire a shot across the bows, any warnings. So, yeah, let's wait and see. Manchester United's part of Jim Radcliffe complaining in a Bloomberg interview, we've got more accountants than we've got sporting people at Manchester United. If we're not careful, the Premier League will finish spending more time in court than it is thinking about what's good for the league. Yeah, that's uh, Jim Ratcliffe in an interview with, with Bloomberg recently. You know, you mentioned him. He's a very, very wealthy man, a multi-billionaire. And you look at the... Ownership... Doesn't use accountants. <laughs> well, you look at the ownership <laughs> class of the Premier League today and, you know, you've got countries, you've got some of the richest people in the world now. When these rules were drawn up, when these good faith rules, it just felt like a different club of people that you're dealing with. You're now dealing with like enormous... Uh, businessmen, enterprises, countries, and, and obviously the attendant legal advisors that brings. It's almost like the people the Premier League is trying to manage are, are some of the most pow powerful people in the world and want the world to bend in their own way. It's, it's just a really hard group of people to suddenly corral now, whereas when the rules were drawn, it just wasn't this, this type of person. Talking of uh, that Jim Radcliffe interview, Quite a few headlines as a result of his lack of focus, perhaps, on the women's team, which has been the case historically at Manchester United when we'd heard one of the reasons why the women's team was disbanded. It was only reformed, what, about five, six years ago, was because uh, Sir Alex Ferguson wanted all resources to be focused on the success of the men's team, and it was highly successful, clearly. That would be the indication of this new era of leadership at United as well. When the men's team does dominate the mood of the club, the finances coming in, but you know the growth of the women's football means that if you do overlook that, it can prove damaging. We've got Mary Earps who's set to join Paris Saint Germain, one of the biggest names in world football. Yeah. So what, what did Jim Ratcliffe? What did he say about the, when he was asked about the, the women's team specifically? Well. It, it, it was it was it was the news that came after that. But Jim Ratcliffe, Rob, when we were there at the the meeting with him, when he first um, was cleared and announced that that the deal had gone through, Rob, you you actually asked him when we were there at his offices opposite Harrods in in, in West London. You asked him about the women's team and what, what kind of response did you get back then? Yeah, I mean, I did notice it was a room full of male journalists. So I thought it was even more of a need to ask about the women's team so we weren't overlooking it given the status of the women's game growing particularly after the World Cup you got the sense it wasn't something he was involved with he did defer the question to someone else although when I asked about stadium plans and whether he'd build a stadium for the women's team because Manchester City have a dedicated stadium for the women's team now with its own sponsorship deal that's when he said the existing Old Trafford could potentially be downsized and that used for the women's team and a new Old Trafford for the men's team. Well, it struck me that it was on the... He, 
Uh, maybe I'm over egging it just for effect. Here, but he didn't really care. That that seemed to be the the kind of obvious thing because he hadn't really thought about this. And why this is in the news now is because of the revamps to the training grounds. So they're trying to redo the training facilities so the men and Manchester United have best in class training, something that people Ronaldo in the past had complained about, something Ratcliffe had talked about. But in the meantime, that would mean they said the them training where the women train and the women moving to I think the word was porter cabins, and that is why the current uh, debate this week has, has stoked itself. I think we should make clear, by the way, that that is a trademark word you just used there, and I think we would call them a portable cabins, uh, Tarek. We don't know if they are actually... No, temporary buildings. Temporary well, buildings. My contract with the, the company Porter Cabin must be revealed here. This Greenberg interview, he did say, Ratcliffe, that he was asked about the women's team, and he basically sort of, you know, stumbled around a bit and said, oh, well, the focus hasn't been on that, uh, he admitted. Um, which, uh, you know, with the, the, the transfer window about to open, I, not surprisingly, there's a eyebrows raised. I mean, and you can see the need for a dedicated team to focus internally on the women's team because it needs its own growth, development, compared to the men's team. There, there is a world where you could see these teams spinning off to people who really want to invest in them and, and own them. We've seen it um, in, in France with, with, with Lyon. Michel Kang has invested in, in the women's team in Lyon. I wonder if we're going to see that happen in, in women's football in England, perhaps with, with owners who clearly don't have a focus on that and others who would like to grow those, those teams spinning off. And we see that with Chelsea exploring potentially selling a stake in the women's team. So that's been a focus on the football. But we are building up to the Olympics, aren't we, in Paris. Athletics is something that we've focused on in recent weeks about how does it try to use prize money to incentivize performance. Well, we have a completely separate plan now from World Athletics, which is providing that prize money for gold medalists at the Paris Olympics. It's Michael Johnson who's launched the Grand Slam track, which is a new athletics league. It's going to have £100,000 prizes for athletes. So many things about this. How do we think this format will work? Will it win over the public? Will it help to sort of captivate people in a way that perhaps the Diamond League isn't? Yeah, I think, yes, although the, that is the, the winners will get that money, they will also get quite a lot of, of base appearance money um so i think you know if you if you wave a, a, a large checkbook every top athlete in the world is going to come running uh, um so i think it's probably got a decent chance now um i think josh kerr is the the british world 1500 meter champion he's going to be at the first britain to 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 join this and there's a lot of money behind it from the investors. So, uh, and they're not, for once, they're not Saudi investors. Who are they, Zeke? Well, where are these? Who are these investors? Do we know who they are? Because we're just saying investors, lots of money. One of the things we'd like to know is where, whose money is it? If it? Yeah, it's a group called Winners Alliance. They've also been involved in um, cricket. Uh, it's an American based. Um, but they call themselves a global athlete centric commercial solution. But basically, it's um, using a lot of, of uh, investors' money to try and make money themselves. I think the question is, though, if the current competitions aren't really attracting that global attention, is big prize money enough to suddenly win over audiences? Is that the fact they're going to be competing for lucrative amounts going to incentivize people to watch? Because mm -hmm. There aren't the names at the moment. There aren't the stars of the sport that are must-watch for people as a global event. In a way, as we're sort of talking about the Euros here at the moment, even Copper America too. Yeah, it's a busy, busy old marketplace, isn't it? How do you how do you get people to care? Yes, you're going to have the money, but you need to create the buzz around it. Get TV, get these dare I say influencers or people who who kind of speak to social media, get people talking about the thing. Because there isn't that much coverage that this launch had around the world. It wasn't a big global talking point. It was a bit of a sort of side story. And it was launched just as the Euros were starting. You've got a 
dominating event. You need to pick your moment, as I would say, when there's less sport going on around the world on that day to become a talking point. Yeah, maybe. I think there's that is definitely a challenge. Um, and I think, it, you know, it, it's going to be very much, it's going to be like two USA venues uh, and two others around the world. So I think it is going to be sort of quite a US focused, perhaps. But I think the sort of difference will be like, for example, if you look at the Diamond League Athletics, the way that's set up is if if they think that somebody's going to go for a record, say in whatever, the 5,000 metres, they will actually restrict very much, you know, who's going to take part in that competition. So they'll have the person who's going to, who's going to run the, the 5,000 metres aim for the world record or whatever. They'll have pace setters, um, but they won't then, you know, for example, they, they won't ask their biggest rival to take part in it. So I think if you're going to talk about you know, this is going to be sort of head to heads, I think, I think if anything is going to work, this might work, but, you know, there's definitely a lot of wait and see. It was interesting you, you mentioned that be head to heads. We talked about this the last time we did the pod with the boxing, another sport that we don't have the best competing against the best all the time. Of course, this is the the Saudi innovation to create that league. And if if it is the best, be the best, then perhaps the you know you will get you will get um, you know a better audience return at least because you don't want to watch uncompetitive sport, do you? Put a 100 metres race on maybe at a half time of a European Championship football match. <laughs> maybe you just need to think differently like that. Well, they are certainly thinking differently at the LA 2028 Olympics. Has happened before, not for a long time, though. Athletics won't be completing the games. It's going to be in the first week with swimming moving to the second week. This is all about the venue being used. Yeah, it's really interesting, though, uh, because... You know, for Olympics after Olympics, there's always been this view amongst athletes that the swimmers, you know, swim for the first week and then they go mad in the Olympic Village afterwards and basically spend the second week getting drunk and having sex. And uh, now they won't be able to. The athletes can do that. Nice of them to give somebody else a chance for once to enjoy all of that uh, stuff, Martin. But this is also... Um, a big deal in the sense of moving moving swimming into the the main stadium, right? That Los Angeles Stadium it will host the opening ceremony and then host swimming. So tens of thousands of tickets to be sold for, for swimming. Um, you know, obviously a big venue, also big money. LA run by Casey Wasserman, the sports agency head. Um, this, again, will bring even more income to the for the organisers, something that they've been very, very focused on. That's though looking ahead to 2028. Build up to Paris, though. Deep concern this week about the inclusion of a volleyball player in the Dutch squad, given a past conviction. Yeah, this is something which um, caused concerns with the British Olympic Association. But even though it, it's, a, it, it's a Dutch beach volleyball player, Stephen van der Velde, that he... Um, was convicted in in England um, a, a few years ago for when he was nineteen, travelling to Britain and raping a twelve year old girl, um, and, and he pleaded guilty to three charges. Um, was sent to prison for four years. Um, went back and served one year in Dutch jail before being released. Now. The Dutch have um, allowed him to um, start competing again, the Dutch Volleyball Federation. And now the Dutch Olympic Committee have confirmed he is going to be representing them in Paris. I mean, I'm absolutely sure that wouldn't happen in the, with Team GB because they have rules in place around um, safeguarding and bringing the game to disrepute. Uh, the IOC refusing to get involved too. They're saying it's just one for the Dutch Olympic Committee. Van der Velde himself said, I can't reverse it, so we'll have to bear the consequences. It's been the biggest mistake of my life. As for the Dutch Volleyball Federation, well, they said that uh, he met all the qualification criteria and he met the guidelines set out in the conditions for athletes to resume competing after a conviction in the organisation's guidelines integrity record. Yeah, and he says he's been through a a, a process of um, 
the professional counselling and rehabilitation. That's actually the Telegraph, the, the Dutch newspaper, has taken a sort of quite sympathetic line towards him. I thought it was just strangely sympathetic, saying, oh, you know, they, they have much harsher interpretations in, in, in the UK um, and that it, it, it was consensual because, you know, British law says you can't, if you're a 12 year old, you can't have consensual sex with an adult, which uh, I think most people would probably agree with. Well, that we're we'll following that one as we build up to the games. A completely different issue that's dominating the preparations for Paris is the ongoing scrutiny of how the World Anti Doping Agency responded to the investigations into doping case involving Chinese swimmers. Uh, Tarek, something you've been reporting on and digesting all the later statements from WADA who are still going on the attack. Do they believe this approach is the one that's working or is it aimed at an audience that they're trying to be keeping on their side? Yeah, another very aggressive statement from WADA, um, which comes in a week in which there were congressional testimonies held on the issue in the U.S., Michael Phelps, among the people called the great Olympic swimmer, Alison Schmidt, um, another swimmer, Travis Tiger, the head of WADA, was there. But there was an empty chair with a name plaque. Uh, Vitol Banker, the WADA president, he was invited but did not show up. Then WADA put out a statement talking about how this is a, a political stunt, essentially, by, by the United States. Um, however, WADA have also acknowledged that perhaps China did not follow the rules as they should have done in this case. And what we're talking about, this was the 23 swimmers that somehow had ingested a prescription heart medication a few months before the Tokyo Olympics. What should have happened is people should have been notified about this. A process should have taken place didn't happen. Uh, ARD, the German broadcaster that also broke this story when it did, had reported that some of the Chinese swimmers were not even told that they had tested positive for this drug, which is, which is remarkable in itself. Michael Phelps saying he's lost faith in WADA. Yeah, indeed. The, the WADA statement, I think, was, was, was mad. Uh, to put it to put it to put it lightly, I mean it's like if it, going on the attacking the Americans, basically saying that there's there's hypocrites, um, and they're saying um, ten percent of athletes in the U.S. Um, who get tested are not receiving the sort of support they deserve. And really, reality is illustrated by the fact that thirty one percent of American athletes were not sufficiently tested before the Tokyo Games. Well, I mean. What is the point of the WADA trying to sort of attack its, you know, just because Travis Tiger and the US anti-doping have been so critical? As the global anti-doping body, shouldn't WADA really just be trying to um, rise above this and prove to the rest of their members that actually they are a um, genuine organisation who haven't covered things up and are going to do things properly rather than just and attacked the US anti-doping agency for, for, for being critical. Not from the wider perspective, when they seem perplexed by all the outcry, because as they put it, it's a relatively straightforward case of mass contamination. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, uh, a straightforward shooting weekend, to coin a phrase. When it involves 23 swimmers, uh, as their statement says... Folk, the focus on no fault contamination case from two, 2021 involving 23 swimmers from China. The hearing sought to further politicise a relatively straightforward case of mass contamination that's been turned into a scandal by a small number of inv individuals, mainly in the United States. I'm guessing, Tarek, you'd probably be counted amongst that small number. Yeah, I haven't been to the United States for a while, but yeah, maybe so. But, you know, I found it funny and you made that point. A straightforward mass contamination case i mean <laughs> it's quite funny when you, you put all those words together and don't forget this isn't this contamination was for a prescription heart drug that has no place being anywhere near food and has never been found to have been a cause of mass contamination so far from straightforward i thought had joe sapelt of ard made a good point it, you know 
do we even know if these 23 Chinese athletes were even staying in that hotel? Were they all staying there? Were some of them there? We, we don't even know that. Do we want to know that? That's what they were told. And it seems, with all of this, it seems WADA took um, almost everything the Chinese authorities and the anti-doping agency said at face value and uh, tried to move on. We've wait, still waiting for that report, of course, that WADA have found the Swiss former prosecutor in the canton of Vaud, where the IOC is based, to conduct a um, quite narrow uh, investigation into how it responded. What it's not doing is taking the heat out of this scandal in any way. Probably as we get closer to Paris and we're looking at the sporting competitions themselves, it could just get more attention as we start to hear from athletes more because they're going to be encountering a spender in time with the media. But as Wada say, they don't want to be dragged into a broader struggle between two superpowers. Us three, not quite so superpowers, have been digesting everything through the week. You're off to get a selfie with a footballer and to get your personal endorsement deal. Well, I'm actually going to meet all the influencers to just teach me how to do it. It seems they're in a growing business. and I think we might be heading in the other direction. Who would say we don't have influence ourselves on here? Yeah, well, perhaps we can um, get some VIP uh, selfies somewhere. Somewhere. Invitations welcome sportonlockpod at gmail.com messages at sport unlocked on x facebook and instagram anonymously if you wish to do so always welcome your feedback challenge us on our opinions but for now thank you for listening goodbye